Um, okay, so when I decided to do that talk, I said, okay, I have plenty of time, 45 minutes. Uh, I don't even know if I will be able to fill up 45 minutes. Then I ended up with 53 slides. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, first, if you've never been to one of my talks, you might be taken aback because there's no word on my slides. Why? Because I'm a mom and I found out that when there were words in my slides, people were reading them and not listening to me. And I'm a mom. It's infuriating people not listening to me. So I removed all words from my slides which is very convenient for me, not so much for you. So this is the link to the annotated slide where you will be have access to the same slides with words. For whatever reason, if you need some words because my accent is weird or because you have ADHD or because you're jet lag, because there was a great party yesterday or just uh, because you have hearing issues or whatever, feel free to use that and you will be able to follow with uh, bullet points and so on. And also it's uh, better to share some slides with words because even though there are some cute kittens in the background, it's not very tech relevant. So who am I? My name is Leticia Avo, which is kind of annoying because no one can say it properly internationally. If you're French, you, you know how to pronounce it, but else it's difficult. And I'm pretty sure my parents did that on purpose. Uh, so if it's, uh, Leticia is difficult for you, just know that it's the Latin name uh, equivalent is Joy. So you can call me Joy. Um, I'm the PostgreSQL Europe treasurer. I'm also the founder of Postgres Women, which is an association of women trying to bring more women and attendees into Postgres events. And also, when they attend, then we try to push them on stage. Um, I'm working at EDB, as you see. No, won't work. Okay. Uh, I'm working at EDB as the practice leader for Postgres and security. It means that any tech person with a question regarding Postgres or its security will contact me. I don't know everything, of course, but I can do some research and I can also contact friends who might know. So that's my job, finding answers to questions. Um, I write, I try to write regularly of my, on my blog, haven't done that for sometimes now, mydbnotebook.org. If you have a question, you can send it to me on my email address, which is on the blog, and it might be picked for the question of the month where I will uh, publish a blog post about, with your answer. I'm also responsible for this small website, psqltips.org, because I found out that people were into PG admin, which is kind of okay, but when you have to connect to a server at 2 a.m. and not everything is working and you just have PSQL, it's too late to learn how to use PSQL. So I created that website because I know that PSQL is harder to learn, but you will become way more efficient if you know how to use it correctly. This website will just show you a tip at random and you can refresh and get more tips. At the moment, I have 150 tips. The main goal is to have between 250 and 300 tips at the end. So it's a work in progress. So we will talk about permissions, users, roles, groups, so on. We will begin with definition, then we'll go through attributes, permission, in inheritance, and of course we will go through role level security because that's the fun. And then we will talk about best practices. And best practices can be summed up in keep it simple and stupid because that's what I love with engineering. We always try to overcomplicate things where sometimes it's not needed. So what's a user. 
A user is one of the four things you need to connect to a, to a database in Postgres. The four things are a server or an IP address or a directory if you're doing a socket connection, a port, a database, and a user. It's un unrelated to the operating system user normally, but you might want to have some mapping between your database user and your operating system user. And we have some authentication that will automatically provide connection to Postgres if your user is already connected through the operating system. If you want to create some mapping for different names between database user and OS user, I really encourage you to go see the PG ident file in the Postgres documentation. I don't have time to uh, explain that more in detail, but that's a, that's a good thing to know. Um, so, how do we create a user? Create user. Nicole Ren here, if you don't know who is Nicole Ren Etable de la Brière Le Pout, she was the first human computer. So, go look her up. You will find her Wikipedia page and all she did for computing and mathematics. If you want to change a user, you will use alter user. Simple. And if you want to drop a user, you will use drop user. Okay, that's simple. Let's go into groups. A group, it's a set of permissions. A group can be assigned to a user. If you look at the annotated slide, you see that I don't write down that you can assign a group to another group because Yes, you can do that. You can also shoot yourself in the foot. That's not necessarily something that you want to do. So if you find yourself in a situation where you think, oh, I need to assign that group to that group who is also a member of that group and that group, maybe you need to rethink your permission system because, again, you want to keep it simple and stupid. So normally groups are meant to make administration, administrating users easier. It can definitely be the opposite. So be very careful with groups and how you assign them. So how can we create a group? Great group. If you don't know who the West Area computers are, go to Wikipedia, see their page, and learn what they did for the computing world. Um, if you want to alter a group, alter a group. If you want to drop a group, drop group. Okay, that's easy. But what is a role? A role is a generic term for a user or a group. A user actually is a role with login permissions, whereas a group is simply a role. And literally, in Postgres code, Groups and users are aliases for roles. It's not a different function uh, inside. This is the same code running. So it's written in the documentation. Create user is now an alias for create role. And create group is now an alias for create role. And I went further. I went into Postgres code because each time I had the occasion to see and look at, at Postgres code, I go there. So here is a create role function in uh, Postgres code. And you see that when you find yourself in the case where you did a create user, you just uh, create a role and you add can login equals true. So a role is a user with login permission. And a group is just a role. And also you see that someone added a comment here saying that maybe we don't want user to inherit to default uh, having inherited activity by default for users. It was never implemented to remo remove that, but that's a possibility that was explored at the time that that change was made, which was in Postgres 8.2. So I think now it's too late. It will never be implemented. So how do we create a role? Well, create role. How do we alter a role? Alter a role. How do we drop a role? Drop role. So you can do the same uh, using the same with users and groups, and it will work with roles. That's one particularity for roles when we're talking 
of rules as objects inside a Postgres cluster. So here is a simple Postgres cluster. These clusters have some objects in it, like table spaces. And then you have databases. Inside databases, you will find tables, sequences, functions and procedures, triggers, foreign data servers, foreign data tables, partitions, so on. Well, partitions are actually tables, but whatever. You will find a lot of objects inside databases, while roles are outside databases. A role is defined for the whole cluster, not for a specific database. So that's a, a specific particularity. It means that when you will run pgdump, it won't export your roles, whereas it might need them because you might have specific permissions when you run pgdump. You need to run pgdump all with the dash g uh, um, flag to export table spaces and roles so that afterwards you will be able to um, import table spaces, role, and then your dump. So the question you might ask yourself is why? Why do we have users and groups in Postgres? Well, it's because before Postgres 8.1, users and groups were distinct kind of entities. So that's from Postgres documentation. Um, before writing the slides, so before last week, I saw that it was for SQL standard compliance that we had create user, alter user, create group, and so on. It's not for SQL standard compliance because the SQL standards uh, defines uh, users and groups and roles as uh, specific to the implementation. In SQL standard language, that means do whatever you want. Um, okay. So groups and users are different in Postgres before Postgres 8.1. Here's a patch idea. It's a very easy to write patch. If you want to do it, I will back you up. If you want to create your first patch, that's a great idea. Remove, create, alter, drop, user, and group. Because I think that the best developers are the ones removing codes, not the ones adding codes. So if you want to do that, please contact me and I will help you to create that patch and I will back you up on the community list to make that happen. At the same time, we could remove this um, utility, create user uh, programs that I don't like. A role has attributes. Um, so, there is a difference between permissions and attributes. And I don't know who decided to make that difference, but it does exist. For example, you might have the permission to read a table, but if you don't have the, the login privilege, you won't be able to ask your, your, your query. So um, this is privileges, and you have several ones. So when you create or alter a role, you will use with, and this is the list of privilege. Of course, you see that for each privilege, you can remove it using no in front of it. So you can create a user that has lo login capabilities, which is very convenient when you want to log in. Uh, as I said, a user is mandatory to connect to a Postgres database. Uh, super user, the one you don't want to give to everyone. Uh, CreateDB will give you the privilege to create databases. Create role gives you the privilege to create roles. Replication is an interesting one. It will uh, give you the privilege to replicate, so to connect to a, a replication slot to get the data. Um, so password is not a privilege, but you can have users without password, and you can have users with password. In that case, you might want to add the password here. I don't like people using uh, alter role, role name with password and password uh, here, because that might end up in Postgres logs, and you don't want having, uh, you don't want your passwords in Postgres logs. Uh, in that case, I use the backslash um, command from PCQL that will uh, prompt you for the password. 
inherits that's for inheritance we will see that later uh, bypass RLS to bypass any low level security and connection limits it's the only one with uh, that you can't deactivate using no connection limit you just have to use the uh, number minus one to uh, use uh, no no connection limit whoops so let's go into vol permissions it does make sense but it's not uh, maybe you ask yourself the question but a table owner always has all permissions on it and an object owner in general always have all permission on that object so that you don't have to really give permissions to select, delete, truncate, whatever on your table for the table owner. So here I created a role, Beatrice Rosley. Again, go look her up. She's great. Um, and I created a table. You see that I used um, a generated uh, identity here. If you don't know that syntax, it's very handy. Um, and I, so it's a simple table with an ID, which is an integer, and a value, which is text. And then um, I alter that table so that the owner is Beatrice Worsley. So let's connect at as Beatrice Worsley. So to connect to a, a different role when you're already connected, well, to act as a different role when you're already connected to the database, you can use set role and the name of the role. So um, here I inserted some value, at least I tried, and it worked. Uh, if you don't know the SQL table, table means select a star from. It's just a, a shortcut. Uh, and I use the backslash JX, which will uh, give you a nice view when your rows are very long. So. I'm able to insert into my table, I'm in the, able to select into my table, and I'm able to delete from that table, which is normal because that user, that particular user, is owner of that table. So far, so great. Then we have the public schema. Behavior changed in Postgres 15. Before Postgres 15, everyone has access to the public schema and could change everything on the public schema. And then we found out that it was not so great for security. So it was changed. So here I create a new role. Again, if you don't know Clara Dan von Neumann, go look her up uh, with login because it's a user. I, I act ask her. And when I try to create a table, I don't have permission on the schema public. So again, that's only for Postgres after Postgres 15. If I grant create on the schema public to Clara Dan van Neumann, and then I act as her, I am able to create that table. Fine. Now, we have permissions um, that are more precise than just create table. And the permission we can deliver to a user or a group depends on the kind of object we are talking about. So uh, the permissions are very precise because Postgres loves to address a whole bunch of use cases. And that's why permission handling is so complicated because you can be so precise that you can say, I want the user of that group to have access to that, 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 but the group have access to that, but I don't want that user from that group to have access to that and so on. It's not because you can do it that you should do it really try to um, make it simple. So you can, uh, these are the permissions you can give depending on the object. And also on a table, you can change the permission depending on the columns. Again, you can do very precise things and very complicated things. Try not to overcomplicate it. So uh, create, select, insert, update, delete, truncate. So that's definitely for uh, tables uh, or columns. 
References is an interesting one. You can give specific uh, permission just to reference a table as a foreign key, a, a column as a foreign key. So that's uh, an interesting one. So even though the person who creates a new table does not have access to that table, it can reference it. Um, you have Trunkit, already said that. Um, and you can uh, give all permissions on uh, one uh, on one table. So here I created an, another table test, the same definition, ID, value. And then um, I alter that table again to give the ownership to Beatrice Worsley. I act as Beatrice Worsley, and as she is the owner of the table, you can grant insert on that table to someone else. So here, I grant insert on table test to Claude Dan von Neumann. So you see that as most of the time in SQL, when you read the, uh, the order, the query, you kind of understand what it means. So you will grant insert permission on the table test to Claude Dan von Neumann. If you act as Claude Dan von Neumann and you try to insert, you will be able to insert, but it's not because you have insert permission on a table that you can read from it. Insert permission does not include read. So it does not include select permission. So here, if I try to select, I'm told that I don't have permission to read that table. I'm allowed to write, not allowed to read. So that's kind of peculiar because most of the time we, we want users to be able to read, not to write, but you can do the other way around. Let's say I create the same table, but that time I don't use the identity because I, I'm clever than that. I will use a sequence that I create manu manually. I change the ownership to Beatrice Worsley again, and I act as Beatrice Worsley. And when I try to insert on my table using the sequence, as you might want to do, then you will see that you don't have permission of that sequence so that you can't use that sequence. It's because in SQL, there is no link between a sequence and a table. That's two separate things. When I used le letter, uh, earlier, when I used the identity column, there is a sequence behind the scene, but Postgres knows that it's kind of linked to the table. That's why it will cascade permissions so that I can insert into that table. But if you create your sequence manually, there will be no link, and then therefore you will need to grant permissions on that sequence too. Inheritance. So. Again, it was supposed to simplify permission management. Um, yeah, that's a joke, actually, because most of the time it does not simplify things. Uh, because we live in a world where it's more complex than having only read-only users, write-only users, and admin. We have more than that. But still, when you ask for permission, try to see the bigger picture and create uh, and try to identify different types of users so that you will create roles based on these different types. Stay away from roles in uh, in with inheritance to other role because when you try to cascade granting like that, you, um, the computer will be fine, you won't. So yeah, try to stay away from that. So the idea is to create roles for different types of users and then to assign those roles to the users. So here, for example, I create a schema called Joy Cure Little. Again, go look her up, she's great. And I create a role called Read Only. And then I will grant usage on the schema draws query little to the read-only role. So granting usage on a schema means that the user will be able to see the schema and see list the objects in the schema. And then 
I will grant select on all tables on the schema to read only. And as it's not uh, enough, here I only grant select on existing tables of my schema. But if you followed, I just create the schema here and I never created any table on it. So you need to alter the default privileges on the schema, grant select on tables to read only. It means that every, each and every new table that will be created in that schema, that particular schema, will have uh, select, uh, well, read only will have select access on them, which is important. So if I create a new table here on this particular schema, same structure, and I create a role called Gwen Bell, again, look her up, she did great things. Um, I can grant this role read only to Gwen Bell. And if I impersonate Gwen Bell, then I'm able to select from my table because the default privileges were changes. And even though the table was created afterwards, I have access to it. So the set rule Leticia, Leticia is my super user role because that's easier and that's classy. Uh, so if I revoke read only from Gwen Bell, so she's now a regular user with no particular permission, and I act as her, you would see that I don't have permission. Actually, I, it's not that I don't have permission on the table, it wasn't that. I don't have permission on the schema. I don't have usage on the schema, so that I can't even see the objects in that schema. But even though I granted usage on the schema to Gwen Bell, she wouldn't be able to read from the table because she does not have select permission on the table. So let's go further. Again, acting as super user, I uh, grant usage on this schema to Gwen Bell. I impersonate Gwen Bell and then I have usage on the schema, but I don't have access on the table. So if you want to give permission to a table to a user, you need first to grant usage on the schema and then to grant select on the table for read-only access. And then it goes further. So let's create a new role, Cassie Marshall. Again, go look her up, she's great. And Sarah Allen, great too. When, um, so let's say I alter default privileges in schema public uh, to give grant selects uh, on all tables to Sarah Allen here. And I alter the schema so that the owner of the public schema is now Cassie Marshall. If I act as Cathy and creates, a and if I create a table, Will Sarah be able to read it? So set rule to Sarah Allen. Permission denied. What happened? If I looked at the default access privilege, you see that the access privilege for Sarah Allen is owned by my super user. Because when I did that, I was, when I did that particular command, I was super user. I was not Cassie Marshall. So that Sarah Allen does not have default permission on all tables on the public schema. So let's try to fix that. Go back as a sysadmin, drop table test. I alter table of fault privilege for my role, Cassie Marshall, in schema public and so on. You can also connect as Cassie Marshall and do the alter default privileges in schema public and so on. It's just that if you want to alter default privileges for another user, you need to specify it there. And if I create that table, go back as Sarah Allen, then I can query my table. And if I look at my default access privilege, by the way, the PSQL command is backslash DDP for default access privileges, you will see that 
you have uh, Sarah Allen has the access from Leticia and from Cassie Marshall. And you can ask yourself why. Well, it's written in the documentation that while you can change your own default privileges and the defaults of roles that you are a member of at object creation time, new object permissions are only affected by the default privileges of the current role they are not inherited. So you have inheritance for roles, you don't have inheritance for default privileges, which can create production problems. So if someone, if you extra sure you give permission to a user and the callback saying, no, I don't have permission, look at this. That might be the reason. Postgres comes with predefined roles, and some are very happy because the main purpose of these predefined roles is to help you manage your roles. So we have, for example, a predefined role called PG Monitor that you can um, grant to your monitoring user so that it has all permission needed to monitor efficiently your Postgres. You have PG Maintain, which is a specified role for vacuum, analyze, uh, re-indexing, and so on, any maintenance uh, operation. So that's um, the PG Maintain is new from Postgres 17. Uh, we also have PG Create Subscription. If you need special permission to create a logical replication, a logical subscription, then there is a predefined role for that exact permission. There are also some roles that I won't advise you to use, like PG Read All Data or PG Write All Data. I think that's not, well, there are some particular cases where it's okay when you have um, a cluster with only one application running on it, then it might be okay. But are you sure that you won't add a new database or a new application into your cluster uh, in the following months or years? And if you do, will you remember to revoke the PG read all data and PG write all data. I don't think so. Also, again, I said that you need to keep it simple and stupid. It does not mean you need to give super user privileges to everyone because that would be simple for sure, but that wouldn't be secured. So the idea is to find a balance between simple and secured, which is always the problem with security. If I have to lock my key with three different locks, it will take me more time, but it will be more secured. But will I every time lock three locks? I won't, I know I'm lazy and I, I, it will end up with locking only one lock. So maybe I need a better security lock in my door so that I'm sure that I will lock it and it will be maybe better or at least equivalent to the three locks. So that's the kind of thing you want to consider with security. Then we have raw level security. So as I said, you can restrict permissions on columns. You can also restrict permissions on rows, depending on the values of those rows. Um, if you don't need it, don't use it. It's that simple. Uh, I know it's shiny of your resume to say, I did more level security, but it will take a performance hit each time. And I've never seen any customer saying to me, oh, I don't care about performance. No, everyone cares about performance. So before implementing role level security, you will have to take the balance between security and performance. Um, so role level security are role based and it will restrict, select, insert, update, uh, and delete rights on certain roles depending on the condition, like a workload, for example. So as it's very generic, I try to come up with a kind of example to demonstrate how it works. So here I create a table sisters. So if you don't know what sisters is, Again, go look it up. Um, then I create a role 
which is called member. And I create a role, which is called admin. Then I create a role, Anita Borg. Uh, so it's uh, with login, so she can log in. And I create another one called Je Robin Jeffries. Again, these women are wonderful. Go look them up. And um, I grant select on sisters to both my roles, admin and members. So far, so good. Then I insert some values. Anita Borg, Robin Jeffries, and an, uh, an email address. Anita Borg, Rosario Robinson. Again, Wikipedia. Rosario Robinson, what did she do? And uh, an email address. Okay. If I. Okay, it was really late yes, uh, yeah, uh, this morning when I finished my slide, and half is missing. So I created a policy, and it's not there. Sorry about that. I will fix my slides. Um, so I created a policy so that. When a role was granted the role admin, it meant that it could see roles where the current user was uh, the same as the one in the column admin. And I created another policy called member, well, system member, where the uh, person was allowed to see the role if the current user was equal to the column member. So here we see that Anita Borg, as I uh, showed earlier, she's a member. No, I didn't show it. Yeah, okay, half is missing, sorry about that. So Anita Borg is a member of the admin group. So that when she requests data from the sisters table, she have access to the, all the roles where Anita Borg is listed as admin. And then if I act, as Robin Jeffries, Robin Jeffries is a member, not an admin, so that she will have access to all roles where she is a member. And it doesn't even show there are other roles. It's not obfuscation, it's really only uh, providing data that this user is capable of seeing. Again, it's cool, it's great in production, try not to use it. Or if you want to use it, create simple policies. Because I've already seen uh, so nightmare, nightmare productions where they had all this kind of weird policies with uh, uh, very complicated things and rules uh, with inheritance from rules and other rules and so on. And at the end, they had performance issue. And there's not so much we can do. Well, we can add more runs, uh, one, more RAM, one, more CPU, and uh, faster disks. But uh, Postgres in itself needs to process the policies if you have enabled policy and role level security. So my advice is if you can stay away from it, stay away from it. So best practices. Um, if I had to sum up in one line, it would be restrict permissions to the maximum. That's all. Um, I found out that it's a little more complicated than that, well, or and that I needed to elaborate from time to time. So what I see as a best practice is to create some kind of users that are mandatory for production cluster. And when I say production cluster, it's a critical production cluster. So if it's a critical production cluster, you should high, have high availability, which means streaming replication. So you will need to create one user per replication because you don't want mix-ups between the users and replication. So you will create one user for each replication. You can use one user that will be shared, but I, I'd rather use different ones. Um, normally, if it's a critical production system, you have some monitoring. Use a different user for monitoring. And if, you, if your monitoring tool allows it, don't use super user as monitoring user. Uh, normally, I also advise to have a different user for backups. And 
if you have some maintenance, for example, uh, if you have some uh, regular vacuum analyze or whatever, uh, then I would advise to use a user for maintenance. Actually, my act my real advice would be look why you need those operations because maybe your Postgres is not set up correctly so that uh, auto vacuum is not good enough for you. So maybe you need to tune it up so that it can perform uh, more efficiently and you won't need to re-vacuum every night or every week or whatever. Um, and um, what I see regularly is um, because it's too difficult apparently to ask developers what tables their application is using uh, they don't know. I I don't know why they don't know, but uh, they are not even able to say which query they sent. So uh, that might explain why. So my advice is to use one user for read only for each application and one user for read write for each application. And of course, you will have exceptions. You will have people asking for other permissions. And then it's your role to design that too. And I can't do that for you. But the best practices are to try to separate the usage so that you know that in your log, when you have that user logging, it means that it will perform that kind of operation. So to sum up, permission management can become very complex. Actually, I'm pretty sure that in any production system, real production system, it's complex. Uh, so if you see that it becomes something very, very complex and difficult to manage, try to take the time to see the bigger picture and to create some generic roles that you can assign to your users. Uh, if you are interested in Kerberos authentication to say like, yeah, I will use my uh, uh, Active Directory users into the database, please don't. Uh, because that's a nightmare to maintain. Actually, Postgres does Kerberos authentication, but there's no mechanism to synchronize your users with uh, your OS user, your Active Directory users with your database users. So that might not be a, a good idea. Um, if you can, try to avoid exception permissions. Try to avoid the temporary permissions that you know that will last for months and years and will become a problem and try to grant only what's needed. Okay, thank you. This is question time. Thank you for your talk. Um, what I always find hardest is to do another the research the other way around to find what grants a specific user has. Are there any advice on queries on that? Because that's the hardest part of my job at this moment. Yes. So Postgres gives uh, PSQL gives backslash du, but it will only give you permission for that user. But if it inherits other permissions, then you will have to go further. Therefore, you will have to query the catalog with a recursive CTE. Uh, so yeah, I, if you give me a, your email, I can send you the query. Uh, it's not that complicated. It's just that uh, it feels like Postgres should be do better and have a view that will provide this. Actually, that's another great idea of a patch. A uh, quick note also, backslash Z, it shows you permissions on an object, and there's some like has access to functions in the system catalog, I don't know. Uh, but question for you, Leticia, you mentioned uh, using a separate role for backup and restore. Is there some reason for that, or is it just a, you know, there's tons of permissions that super users have that you don't need and shouldn't give out? Uh, no, uh, you mean that uh, I mentioned to use a specific user for backups. Uh, it's because then 
you uh, so uh, I have also a talk about logs and I like to log everything, not every single query, of course, because performance, but a lot of things. And in particular, I like to know when a user connected and when they disconnected. So if you spread the users, you will have control and knowledge on what happened at that moment. So that's the reason why I, I advise to separate uh, backup users. And the next one will be uh, will be just there so that you can run a little more. <laughs> All right. Uh Let's say, will you support a patch to return things back to groups? Because the worst thing about current situation is that all our best intentions, giving permissions to groups and giving non-login roles to login roles, breaks by the ability to alter no login role, making it login. And that's uh, like, you know more than anybody in this audience to what extent I'm getting to tame the users, uh, but like... I already told by many people from the community that's impossible, there's no way back. But I would love to allow to disallow it. Um, no, I won't support that. Actually, I would support giving permission to uh, change that logging thing on rules uh, to the right person so that they don't do oopsie. Well, everyone do, does oopsies, we know. But... Uh, we can reduce the risk that way. I, I love the way of seeing rules as something generic, and I'm all in for rules instead of users and groups. Okay, so I will be there just, uh, around. If you have any questions, come see me. Thank you.